Good morning, High Street community. Welcome to worship this morning. We want to just bless the Lord together as we worship him as a God who is all-powerful, who is majestic in all of his glory and wants us to see him and worship him this morning. So in the comfort of your own homes or wherever you are, um, just want to encourage you to find a space where you can worship him this morning with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength.
Okay. Take two. Cut. Take two. <laughs> All right. Welcome, everybody, to High Street. We're so glad you're joining us. We're excited to be here. we got a big team here today, and thank you, worship team, for being here. So fun. Um, we hope that you are enjoying service so far. Um, just a few announcements. Connect groups will be meeting. Um, if you're meeting today, you meet at 11 out of the Zoom group. Some groups meet during the week, so we hope that you are enjoying those groups. And there's still time to join a group. Um, if you feel like you want to be a part of a small community, a smaller community, to um, share prayer requests, just be able to talk and listen to one another, you can still join a group. Just contact Pastor Danny. His email is on the little slide. Um, also, a little update from the church life meeting. Um, we did elect Janelle Holbrook and Joan Smith to the nominating committee. Woohoo! Excited about that. Um, and actually, that's all the announcements we have today. Oh, sorry. Budget was passed. So that's good news, too. Okay. And now we'll just take a deep breath and. Um, we're going to go into our scripture reading today, which is from Psalm 119. We're going to read verses 33 to 40. It's good to just pause and read God's word. So you can listen, close your eyes. Open your Bible to Psalm 119, verse 33, um, and just join your hearts as we hear from the Lord. Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I will keep it to the end. Give me understanding that I may keep your law and observe it with my whole heart. Lead me in the path of your commandments. For I delight in it, incline my heart to the testimonies, and not to selfish gain. Turn my eyes from the looking at worthless things, and give me life in your ways. Confirm to your servant your promise, that you may be feared. Turn away the reproach that I dread, for you, for your rules are good. Behold, I long for the precepts. In your righteousness, give me life. Let's pray. Lord, it's so good to hear from you and um, open up your word, worship with one another. Just be reminded of your presence, of your power, of your goodness, that we can trust you that we can depend on you in hard times, that we can reach out to one another, and that we can trust you to provide for every need that we have. Lord, you know our needs. You know them before we can even speak them. And we're so thankful for that. We want to remember, Lord, to be thankful for the things that we can be thankful for your truth, your word, your presence, your love, your forgiveness, your grace, your control over the world. Lord, you are in control. Let us trust you. We ask you to join us now and just, Lord, make your Holy Spirit just move in the homes, wherever people are watching, we ask that you would move in their heart, that you would open their heart and encourage them today. We all need encouragement, Lord. We need it from one another, and we need it from you. So we ask that. We expect it. Bring joy to our heart because we've been together. Thank you, Lord. We just hand it all over to you, and we're thankful. Amen. You're my 
see There is nowhere we can hide from your love You are steadfast, never failing You are faithful All creation is in awe of who you are You're the healer of the sick and the broken You are comfort for every heart that mourns Our King and Savior forever For eternity we will sing of all you have done For eternity we will sing of all you have done We sing between us God with us God for us nothing can come against no one can stand between us your heart it moves with compassion for that truth that God is with us and he sent his Holy Spirit into this world at Pentecost and we learned this song a couple of weeks ago I just want to encourage you to find this space where you can accept his spirit as a mighty rushing wind in your life and in your heart
morning, High Street. As we enter this new series, I get to share with you a little bit about how it came about. So Danny and I have been having conversations about this time in our church for months now, even the last year. And we've begun to see a theme, both in the series that we've gone through and in our prayers and conversations together and with those around our church. And the main theme that we begin to see is growth. People are hungry, we are hungry. I believe God is leading us towards our church at High Street growing. And we've even seen this before this Sowing Seeds series is starting. We've noticed it in our, um, in our leadership series where we got different parts of the church ready in order to welcome people in. We noticed it in our fishing series, a fisherman's guide, where we thought about the gospel not being about just mending nets, but also about catching others. And we heard lots of great inspiring stories about that. And even in our before and after series, we saw how God can grab the lives of almost anyone and change them through what Jesus did on the cross. And so we're excited about this Sowing Seeds series because it sets us up to anticipate growth in a way like we haven't had before. Sowing seeds, you put the seed in the ground, and as long as there's the right nutrients and water and some time to wait, then we get a, a great amount of fruit and growth out of it. So what we're hoping for as Dandy jumps into the series is that we would be excited and ready to hear some encouraging words, as well as some that are, are warnings and cautions about how to deal with the responsibility of sowing seeds. And the hope in this is that we can begin to plant these seeds in each other's lives, and especially in the lives of the community of those around us. And that while Danny is on sabbatical over the next couple months, we will, we will allow God to tend to the soil of our lives. And during that time, we're praying, anticipating, expecting that, that the series that Danny teaches when he gets back is will be exciting because it'll be about plants and the growth and all that those seeds have begun to bear. So would you begin to pray with us and as we introduce the series, begin to dream with us, get excited about all that God is doing in growing High Street Community Church by using seeds and then using plants later. Sowing seeds. Isn't that going to be... I'm excited. I know what a series is about. Um, thanks, Dave, for doing a great job of really discerning how God has been working in our church, both in the messages and in the life of our church. Um, I'm excited about this season of if you want to grow, it starts with seeds. And so we'll look at this for us, for a, like I said, for about a month. The topics um, in sowing seed are number one, today we're going to talk about be aware. And then we'll move on to be active be hopeful, and then be dependent. And then we'll have a season where I'm on sabbatical and we'll have a wonderful guest speakers that are all lining up. It's looking to be really great. And then in the fall, we're going to launch into a series on plants and let plants of the Bible teach us about growth. And I'm really looking forward to that piece. Um, but before we do any of this stuff, before we even talk about being aware before you plant seeds, it's important to go to prayer. And so I'm going to guide us in prayer um, not only the normal prayer that we pray before we open up God's word, but a prayer really of, of um, a repentance, um, and then asking for God to teach us, asking for God to bless us, and then protect us. So if you would, pray with me um, as I lead us into this series, um, first and foremost, at the, um, with the attention and the provision of God. Let's pray. Lord, we want to grow corporately, individually. But we have to confess, we have to repent, we have to turn towards you because admittedly we don't always look to you and turn to you. And so we do that now and we, we confess that we want to grow. I know I do, um, but I want to grow without the discomfort. I confess that I want to grow without patience. I want to grow my way we want to grow our way. We want to grow without putting in the hard work. So we confess that and turn away from that. And would you, would you teach us? Would you teach us your ways? Would you teach us to learn how to participate with you and your spirit to come alongside of what you're already doing and what you're active in? And we would jump on board with you. Teach us that. Teach us to understand your word. And would you bless us? 
We do want to grow and we want more. Not in a greedy sense, but we want more in terms of your blessing, in terms of your spirit, in terms of all that you have for us. You're an abundant God, overflowing. Bring your kingdom here on earth. Bring your compassion to us, that we would have compassion, that we'd care deeply in our gut for all people. And would you bless us with workers? You said the harvest is plentiful, but pray for workers. So we pray for workers to help in the harvest. Would you bless us? And before we dive in, we'll pause on maybe the most important part, that we declare our dependence on you. We need you. That we would not be deceived, that you would bring us into the truth, um, that we wouldn't choose comfort, that you would deliver us from evil and deliver us from the evil one. Lord, protect us. We're grateful and we thank you and we pray these things in the power and the name of Jesus. Amen. So I'm excited to talk about this stuff. Uh, you, you know I love, um, with my biology background, I love talking about trees and plants. And so today, I, won't talk, I want to talk about plants a lot, and I'll do a little bit. But I'm talking about seeds. And before you plant something, I don't know if you've had this experience, but it's always good to get some advice, to be aware of a few things. And this week, I had the pleasure of taking a few friends. Um, one of them was one of our graduates from our uh, college ministry, Jordan, and a buddy of his. Um, I took them surfing. And so I had to have them be aware of a few things. We went at 6 in the morning, and so I told them it was going to be cold. And then it was a south swell in the water. So I said, you know, the waves will come, but you have to wait maybe 5, 10 minutes of almost being out in a lake, and then suddenly the ocean comes alive with some big waves. I wanted them to be aware of that, be aware of the rocks underwater, the kelp in the water, all kinds of stuff, um, even if they knew it, to reacquaint them of those things. And and it was vitally important to the success of our mission. Same thing's true in plants. Same thing's true in planting seeds. Is it's important to be aware, even if I believe many of you know what I'm going to teach about this morning, what God has for us, but we have to be reminded. And if you don't know, boy, you need to be made aware, um, not only in a warning sense, but in an encouragement sense. Here's the things you shouldn't do or you should watch out, and here's the things you need to do to be successful. And so... Um, sowing seeds, be aware. Our first scripture, I'm going to go through three scriptures. Our first scripture is found in Galatians uh, chapter 6, verses 7 and 9, and it's one of those passages, there's not a lot of wiggle room. It's very direct, very clear, um, and, and very, very important when it comes to the topic of seeds. So I'll read this starting in verse 7. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. I said, no wiggle room. You remember, um, I told the story, some of you may know this, about uh, we, we live on about an acre of land, really blessed, it's a, it's a great piece of property, but when we moved in there, there was a number of things that needed fixing, repairing, changing, and one of those is we had a couple groves of acacia trees, a notorious uh, invasive plant species that doesn't belong here, and it overgrows, it falls down, it's all kind of, you heard me complain a ton about the acacia trees. I'm not going to preach about acacias because we had them all removed. I've cut down a ton and gotten rid of them. But one thing I didn't know and made the mistake of is when you get rid of something, something's going to go in its place. And I not only got rid of one of Santa Cruz County's most invasive trees, the acacia tree, but then I unknowingly invited one of Santa Cruz County's most invasive weeds, the thistle. Cypress thistle. And we actually have some right out there. I was actually going to pick one and bring it in to the sanctuary, but they're so spiky, they hurt my hands. I said, you know what? I'll just show them pictures. I didn't bring any leather gloves. You need like bulletproof gloves to get these thistles. So if we can go ahead and put up a picture of the thistle so we all know what we're talking about. I took a picture of one on a piece of cardboard and see it's, 
it's kind of gangly and long. That's a pretty young one. And they have those purple flowers that become, they, they bloom, and they, they um, send out those little fluffy things that fly in the air. Let's get a close-up picture of the thistle. And you see why I didn't pick it out front, because it will kill your hands. Those thistles hurt. In fact, I got one in my foot. I was wearing flip-flops outside, and it was in my foot for about two weeks. The little thorn, I couldn't see it, couldn't get it out. It's an invasive plant, very painful. And my neighbor taught me that you have to get rid of them by pulling them out by the root. And I'm like looking at my acre, and there are, I don't know, hundreds of them. I hope not thousands of them. And what happened is the, the first year they were there, it rained really late into the spring, so I didn't get them out, and they flowered, and the seeds went even more this year. So this year, I was determined to get out our weed eater, and our neighbor was pulling them out by hand, and I had so many, I just took the weed eater and mowed down the entire acre of, of all these things, and she said, you know, that's not going to get rid of them. You got to pull them out by the root. I said, I know, but I just didn't want them to flower again, so I cut them off before the flowers, and then I had to go back over the whole acre, and over a period of really weeks, hand-pulled roots of these thistles on our property. And you know, the whole time, I'm thinking, this is sin. This is what it's like to have sin in my life. You can't just ignore it. You can't just like cut off the top. You got to get it out by the root. Sin is a difficult, terrible taskmaster. And um, God is gracious and gives us the power and the ability to be forgiven of sin, but also to uproot and get rid of it. And so I learned and am learning a very clear lesson about sin and the effects that it has when it comes to what do you plant? And unknowingly, I had removed acacia trees and made way by disturbing the dirt and making the area open for tons of thistles, one of the worst weeds we have in our county. Well, I was talking about this with my son, Isaac, and he had encouraged me because he had worked with a company that does a lot of digging with tractors. And, and he said, you know, Dad, when there's disturbed dirt like that, one of the things they do is they spread out seeds all over the place, barley seeds. I was like, barley seeds? He's like, yeah, you should look into it. Go down to the farm supply. So I went there and they supplied me with a couple of 50-pound bags of barley seeds, which I then went out and spread all throughout our property. And the barley seed, as I did some research on it, it goes really deep in the roots, and it, of course, produces a food. And so you see the difference here. We can show a picture of the barley. It's uh, about the same size as the plant that I pulled out the thistle, and the roots go really deep. And then let's go really close up. The best part of the barley, you see those seeds. It's reproducing. That was from one seed. It's got, look, I don't know, 40 or 50 seeds just on that one plant alone. And those have been coming up, and they're all over the land and hopefully over time, they will take over the spots where the thistles were. I'm sure I'll have to plant some more seeds. But it's a great picture of this passage. You reap what you sow. When we sow thistles, when we make room for them, and it just lands and takes root, and we don't do anything about it, the weeds could take over our property. Or I do something about it and plant something good, and that will take over our property. So the picture, the last picture I wanted to show you on this is really the scripture is telling us which are you going to sow? The plant on the left, the barley, it leads to life. Or the plant on the right, the thistle, which leads to corruption, destruction. One brings way to life and one brings way to death. It's, like I said, a very straightforward scripture and a straightforward point. And so before we go into planting seeds, the Bible's very clear on when it comes to life, stuff will be planted. What are you going to plant? Seeds that lead to your own comfort and selfishness, which ultimately goes to a form of death or death itself. Or are you going to sow to the Spirit, following God, doing life God's ways? That passage Maria read in Psalm 119 was just about that, that God's ways, God's law, leads to life, ongoing life. That barley is going to keep falling in the ground, and it's going to keep reproducing, and it's going to be more and more and more each year. So that's the initial thing we need to be aware of, is that God, in His love, gives us the choice to choose between life and death, the way of living that begets more life or a way of living that begets more death. That's our first passage. The second passage is in Matthew chapter 13, and it's a parable of Jesus. He's teaching... And I'm not going to read the parable. It's the parable of the soils. 
I'm going to read his interpretation, explanation of the parable, actually. Um, so it's chapter 13 of Matthew, and Jesus is teaching, and he said, you know what? It's like there's this farmer scattering seed, and some of the seed lands on the path, and it's gobbled up by the birds, and some of the pe- seeds land in the rocks, and it, it uh, doesn't make deep roots there, and some of the seed lands among the thistles and the weeds, and it gets choked out, and then the last seeds he was talking about lands in good soil and reproduces, you know, 30, 60, 100 fold. So he was with the disciples after, and he, he gave the real clear um, explanation, which is what I want us to focus on. And I'll read starting uh, in verse 18. Jesus says, Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. As for what was sown on the rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And then when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. As for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, in another thirty. So Jesus gives us this picture of the seed goes out, the good news of God and his kingdom. Here's what goes out, and what, what happens is that some falls along the path. There's not a clear understanding of what God's about. Some falls in the rocks where, you know, we've seen this in our own lives even, but in many lives where life's going fine as long as, you know, until something really bad happens. And then it's like, how could God allow this? Or blaming God. And so, or why should life be so hard? Jesus tells us many times, life will be hard as a follower of him. And bad things do happen. And so a person with deep roots understands it, doesn't enjoy it, but understands that. And then there's the, the challenge of thorns, the thistles that I talked about, where, you know, we, re, we hear the word of God, but then we're tempted to choose a life of comfort. We're, ch- we're tempted uh, to choose fear and worry. And, and, and that's not God's way. And those things will choke out your faith in God. And then he gives us the, the good example of good soil. When the seed lands on good soil. And all this, if, if I was to really shrink down this parable, Jesus is saying like, you get it, and it meaning God's word the gospel, the promise of new life through Jesus Christ. If you understand really who God is and who Jesus is and what he's about, like when we talked about before and after, here's the the difference the resurrection makes. If you understand that, life's completely different. And all these other options of failure are rooted into you don't understand it. And so our job is to really help, number one, do we understand really how much God loves us? Do we understand who Jesus is? Do we understand who his spirit is? And then we're able to share with other people because they've been deceived. They don't understand. And so being good soil is is what we're hoping for. And we're looking for good soil. All those barley, you know, I spread all those seeds all over the place. It didn't grow everywhere. It grew where the soil was good. I wanted to tell a little story, um, if we can put the graphic up, of Johnny Appleseed. When it came to seeds, I said, I, I... I remember the legend of Johnny Appleseed, but did you know, it, it's not just a legend, he's a real person. And this real person lived, you know, a while ago in the 1800s, and he, um, I thought he just walked around spreading apple seeds, and that's not the case at all. In fact, he's a pretty quirky guy, but it, you, you can take, in fact, before you take it down, his hat um, was actually a pot, he would, he would cook in it. <laughs> There's a lot of stories if you want to Google him. In fact, the, the Indians, even warring Indian tribes embraced him. They would tell, even tell their enemies, hey, leave this guy alone. He got along with all the different cultures. He was a really peaceful man and was about a lot of good things. But he didn't just scatter seed. And I bring him up because Johnny Appleseed did something that was unique, is that he actually started nurseries. Not nurseries for babies, but for plants. And he wouldn't just throw the seeds anywhere, but he would purposely find people and places where these apples would thrive. 
and put them under care under people that he would teach. So he's planting things, and the success rate was very, very high because he wasn't just doing whatever. He was looking for that good soil, in a sense. And that's just for apples and in our country. I thought of the fun little picture of what we're talking about. Um, and we're planting God's word far more valuable than apples. And then the last passage I want us to look at, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 3, verses 4 to 9. Again, sowing seeds, God's calling us to be aware. And this, I don't know, you know, I always want to say this is the most important passage. This passage is so important when it comes to planting seeds that if we don't get this, we can really screw up the whole thing. So I want us to listen to this passage. And again, it will be pretty direct and simple, but it's so important that we get this um, for all of us. So 1 Corinthians um, chapter 3, let me turn there, and we're starting in verses 4 through 9. For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not being merely human? What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. For we are all, we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. Isn't that good? The, the point there is that in the, this church um, in, the, in Corinth is that they were kind of squabbling over, you know, well, I follow Paul. He's the real one that I think is great. It was a, you know, a temptation for them to be a personality-driven church. You know, I go to, I have never heard this, I go to Pastor Danny's church. I hope I don't hear that. And I, I usually get what people are saying on that, but the point is, is we follow the Lord and a person doesn't grow a church. In fact, Jesus himself says, I will build my church. So any of us trying to build or grow a church on our own or taking credit, like Paul is saying, hey, if you planted the church, good for you. If you watered it, good for you. But it's all about God. God does the growing part. And again, I'll use my home as an example. We've planted 20 fruit trees. Uh, We, me, I've had a little bit of help, but I dug all these holes. I put in gopher baskets I weeded the area, I put up a fence, I put in water lines, I fertilized it, I've pruned them, I've done all this work. But you know, and I know this, having done plants before, it's really God that does the growing. There's a miracle of life in plants and trees, and and, and it's a miracle whether there will be fruit. And we trust God for that. We certainly do our part. Paul is clear here to say, Apollos had a great part in that church, Paul has had a great part, but they're just parts, and he said, you know what, if you really think about it, we're nothing, because God does the growing. And as God's challenging and calling our church to growth, the reality is, is we play a part. He's gracious to let us participate, but let us never be deceived to think that we have the power to grow a church. We could maybe even gather more people in our sanctuary, but that's not the point of growing a church. People are growing personally and spiritually, and people are growing as a body of Christ, and only God can do that if we'll be dependent and follow and participate with him. So you see what I mean when I say this is a very, very important point, that we don't want to do church growth. We don't want to do personal growth in the flesh on our own, because we saw if you sow in the flesh, you do it all on your own, it's a form of dying. And if you So in the spirit, if we're following the spirit, we're saying, God, where are you active? What are you doing? What would you have us do in line with God and the spirit? That's the kind of growth you want. That's abiding in the vine. Then you'll see real fruit, real fruit from the Lord, real fruit from above. So what? I love that question when we get there in a message. And I want to say, now is the time to plant. And I believe you'll agree with me. Our culture, with what's going on in our world, in our city, in your own personal life. I found a a poem I came across from a gal named Leslie Dwight. She's a 23-year-old author. 
and she posted this poem online, and it went viral. It went all over the place. And this poem, um, well, I'll just read it. It, it really kind of wakes us up because uh, the backdrop of this is, you know, you, you see on social media, people put different posts, and they say, um, let's just cancel the year 2020. Let's just throw it away, you know, and, and I wouldn't blame anybody for feeling that way. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a serious thought and a funny thought, but, you know, you really don't get to do that. Anyways, she lays out this challenge with a series of questions and observations, and I'll just read them. She says, what if 2020 isn't canceled? What if 2020 is the year we've been waiting for? A year so uncomfortable, so painful, so scary, so raw, that it finally forces us to grow. A year that screams so loud, finally awakening us from our ignorant slumber. A year we finally accept the need for change, declare change, work for change, become the change. A year we finally band together instead of pushing each other apart. No, 2020 isn't canceled, but the most important year of them all. Now is the time to plant seeds in your life and in others, to plant God's good news, to be aware of these three things. The first one, and I'll just recap what we've seen in Scripture. Number one, be aware of sin. Watch out for sin. So as I'm talking about sin, um, we can all agree, and that's why I love the picture of the thistle, nobody likes a thistle. Not, not those kind anyways. It hurts your hand. It takes up space from other good plants. Uh, on and on. I won't go on and on. We don't like the thistle. But when it comes to sin, it's kind of this generic overall topic. And what does it mean like, you know, don't sow in sin, but sow in the Lord? I came across a video from the Bible Project that of just like all the videos we've ever used from them there, they say so much in a few minutes' time. So I thought it'd be good for us to look at, you know, what is sin? What does the Bible have to say about sin? So if we can go ahead and play that video, it'll give us a good picture of what we want to avoid and why. Most people assume the Bible has a lot to say about how messed up humans are, and that's true. It's also true that the Bible's vocabulary about this topic sounds odd to modern people, using words like sin, iniquity, or transgression. And so the Bible's perspective on the human condition is often ignored or treated as ancient and backwards. This is really unfortunate. Because through these words, the biblical authors are offering us a deeply profound diagnosis of human nature. Iniquity describes behavior that's crooked, while transgression refers to breaking trust. And sin? This is actually the most common of these bad words in the Bible. So let's focus on it for a few minutes. Sin translates the Hebrew word chata and the Greek word hamartia. The most basic meaning of sin isn't religious at all. Chata simply means to fail or miss the goal. Like when the Israelite tribe of Benjamin trained a small army of slingshot experts, they could sling a stone at a hare and not chata, that is, fail or miss. Or there's a biblical proverb that warns against making hasty decisions because you're likely to chata your way, miss your destination. So in the Bible, sin is a failure to fulfill a goal. But what's the goal? Well, on page one of the Bible, we learn that every human is an image of God, a sacred being who represents the creator and is worthy of respect. And so in this way of seeing the world, sin is a failure to love God and others by not treating them with the honor they deserve. You can see this idea in the famous code of conduct given to the Israelites, the Ten Commandments. Half of them identify ways you can fail at loving God, and the other half name ways you can fail at loving people. And the fact that both kinds of failure are combined shows that failing to honor God is deeply connected to failing to honor people. This is why in the Bible, sin against people is sin against God. Like when Joseph refuses to sleep with the wife of Potiphar, he says, how could I sin against God? In Joseph's mind, failing to honor a human made in God's image is a failure to love God. And so sin is a failure to be truly human, but there's more. 
A fascinating thing about sin in the Bible is that most of the time that people are failing, they either don't know it or even worse, they think they're succeeding. Like when Pharaoh wants to build Egypt's economy and protect national security, in his mind, this justifies enslaving the Israelites. He thinks it's good, and he's totally unaware that it's an epic fail. Or when King Saul is chasing David around the wilderness trying to kill him, he thought he was bringing a criminal to justice until he realizes he's the corrupt one. And he says, I have sinned, I am the failure. So sin is about more than just doing bad things. It describes how we easily deceive ourselves and spin illusions to redefine our bad decisions as good ones. So why are humans such bad judges between moral failure and success? Well, the first appearance of the word sin in the Bible offers an insight. There are these two brothers, Cain and Abel. Their parents had just given in to this beastly temptation to redefine good and evil by their own wisdom, and now Cain is faced with a similar choice. He's jealous and angry that God has favored his brother, and so God warns him, if you don't choose what is good, chata is crouching at the door, it wants you, but you can rule over it. So in these stories, sin or moral failure is depicted as this wild, hungry animal that wants to consume humans. And we know how that story ends. The Bible is trying to tell us that failed human behavior, our tendency towards self-deception, it runs deep. It's rooted in our desires and selfish urges that compel us to act for our own benefit at the expense of others. And it leads to this chain reaction of relational breakdown. This is why in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul describes hamartia as a power or a force that rules humans. In his words, we are slaves to sin. He even says sin lives in us so that the things I don't want to do, that's what I do. So with the word sin, the biblical authors are offering a robust description of the human condition. It's a failure to be humans who fully love God and others. It's our inability to judge whether we're succeeding or failing. And it's that deep selfish impulse that drives much of our behavior. This is not a pretty picture of ourselves, but if we're honest, it's realistic. This is why in the Bible, the story of Jesus is such good news. He's depicted as the creator become a truly human one who did not fail to love God and others. That is, he did not sin. And yet, he took responsibility for humanity's history of failure. He lived for others and he died for their sins. And he was raised from the dead to offer them the gift of his life that covers for their failures. Or in the words of the apostles, he committed no sin, yet he carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to our sins and live to do what is right. And that's the story behind the biblical word for sin. So helpful to get that clarification. It's not just a choose sin or choose life. Uh, we reject sin, but we choose Jesus, who gives us the power and the ability to say no to sin and grows us to the point of maturity and dependence on Christ. So it's choosing Jesus. And that's, um, that's the first part is what are you going to sow? You're going to reap what you sow. So we don't want to sow towards ourselves and our own selfish desires. We want to trust in the Lord and go in his ways and see the fruit that comes through abiding in him. So that's our first thought. The second one is be good soil. Be receptive. When it was grad Sunday, it was so much fun to hear these, um, these graduates talk. And, and I remember Jordan's theme, our college graduate, one of them, and he said, just kind of saying yes to God has been a road of success for him. Just saying yes and being available to what God would have him do. And I would encourage us to practice listening to God. And we talk about this a lot. And I would even say, our church, there are so many people, and I see it all the time, many of you listen so well to God, especially when it comes to saying yes to ministry and saying no to ministry. It's important. I think it's about as important to say no to opportunities as it is to say yes. You just want to discern what God would have us do with our lives and our calling. And so this idea of listening, that's one of the most important things of being good soil is listening to God. And that's actually what I look forward to most when, when I'm going on sabbatical for 12 weeks. Yes, I will rest. Yes, I will play and relax and be renewed. But the most important thing along with those is to listen to God and say, God, what do you have for me in my life and our church? What is it that you want? Who are you? Those core things are so important. So I'd encourage us as we're talking about being aware of planting seeds 
Let's not get lost in the analogy of seas. Let's remember the focus of trusting what work God is doing, discerning it, and then coming alongside as he blossoms and reproduces and grows things. So listening to God is so important to be good soil. And then the last point here is trust God for growth. And I know we have to do that as a church where Jesus, again, he says, I will build my church. And so we ask him to grow our church. And again, not numbers of gathering people here, although that's important, but we want to develop and be Christ followers. That's kingdom gain and kingdom growth is what we're after. But also true in personal growth. And if you're like me, sometimes I've got areas of my life where I'm still not grown up. And I, I mean, I don't know what else to say it. It's a bummer. And, and, and I want to do all I can. I want to lift myself up by my own bootstraps. And yet God is patient and God promises to grow us. But it's not always instant. It, it takes a while. And we need to depend on God because that, that passage I read in 1 Corinthians where Paul is like, you know what? These people water, these people plant, but God causes the growth. So my encouragement to you this morning um, Not only be careful of what you're sowing, and not only be attentive and be good soil, but to trust God. You know, God is the one that's going to cause growth in your life and in our church. And on that that note, let's trust God by praying as I close in prayer. Father, we are ready. We are excited. Um, We want to join you in your plans and your ways. So we turn to you, our first First response is to turn to you and pray. And we just ask this simple prayer, Lord, would you lead us into your abundant life? Would you inspire us into your harvest as workers? And would you grow your kingdom? And be bold enough to use even us to call more people to following you. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. You give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord. Sing it out. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. You give light, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope. All the earth.
earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. With your You are here, commending every 
when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. know that? God is working. And even though we can't see it, um, that's who he is. He's working. And for our benediction this morning, I wanted to read another farming seeds type of uh, passage that encourages us. I mean, I got to say this, in this room, without you all here worshiping, the band sounds amazing, the worship is amazing, but the room needs to be filled with your voices, and we have to be patient, and that's tough, and we're trusting God to be working in us and through us, even in this season, but I look forward to the time when we can come back together and worship together. So the challenge and the call is to be patient, um, not only in waiting for our gathering, but be patient in the Lord and what He's doing. And so hear these words from James chapter 5. Verses uh, 7 and 8. Be patient, therefore, brothers and sisters, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it, until it receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Have a good week. Amen. Thank you.